I believe this is a good moment to begin. First, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Science Circle. I think most of you are uh, old. Here in virtual reality, it's a nice Sunday morning, but I know that for many of you, it is much, much later, and in fact, it may be the dreaded early Monday morning. So uh, thank you for coming, <laughs> and I hope that uh, what I present will be of interest. So I'm going to swing around here so I can see the uh, slideshow. Today's presentation is called Optics for Photographers. And I was motivated to do this presentation because I had noticed that a lot of uh, young people, many people entering in photography, uh, didn't really have much of a background in optics. Uh, they were uh, uh, learning things from uh, camera manufacturer ads and uh, uh, common knowledge but uh, they didn't really know how optics worked. So I thought that I would present uh, optics at a level that I would be used. I'm principally going to be using ray tracing. Optics, well, I'm going to start with the pinhole camera. Now, pinhole cameras are both interesting and fun to use, and they do illustrate a number of basic Then I will relate pinhole optics to tactical lens optics, bring in the ideas of focal length, depth of field. And we'll also talk about uh, ISO, which is the gain of uh, the image sensor, and uh, aperture and shutter speed. Um, <clears throat> someone is saying that my voice is fading in and out. Does that Okay, I don't know what's changed here. Uh, it was okay earlier. Um, let's just see if it will go along and if it stays together. Okay, so let's make a pinhole camera. So to start with, we'll take a body cap and we will drill a hole right through the center, basically ruining its use as a body cap. We'll cover that with a bit of foil, secure the foil with tape, and then use a fine needle to uh, make a pinhole in the foil, and then mount that to our camera. Now we'll just set up for a shoot. And you can see I just sort of set up on my balcony here and uh, provided two little mannequins to be So here is a picture that you can get with a pinhole. Now I want you to notice that, of course, it has lousy resolution because it is just the pinhole. But all sections have the same lousy resolution. There is no feeling of a change in focus throughout the image. And that is referred to as having a flat image. Now let's see why that is using ray tracing. So here I've set up a little virtual model being shown to you in virtual pinhole and my two mannequins. I'm going to take away the camera so you can see the sensor and uh, its relationship to the pinhole and, and our uh, subjects. We can trace right light rays. <clears throat> from each position uh, on uh, the subjects through the pinhole to the image. Okay. Oh, and I just should mention that light rays are a convenient but fictional construct. Uh, we can use them mathematically, but of course, uh, in modern physics, light behaves entirely differently. Okay, so each point on the object is mapped to a corresponding point in the image. Okay. 
you can uh, think of pinholes as mapping angles. So we're going from three-dimensional coordinates in a uh, real world to a two-dimensional representation. You lose a dimension. However, looking at the image, uh, one of the capabilities of human vision is that we can analyze the image and store that lost depth information. Okay. And uh, that also is the source of a lot of optical illusions. For example, here I've drawn a little uh, quadrilateral between the heights and the uh, positions of my two. It shows clearly that in that image, they seem to be different sizes, but in the world, they're the same size. So, let's take a look at uh, some of the features of this representation. Um, you say my voice is still breaking up? Hmm. Is it uh, being a bad problem? Well, I'll just continue on. Okay, so it's basically going to be all, all about triangles and drawing our light ray lines from the objects through the pinhole to our image sensor. Magnific oh, well, let me go back for a moment. I just wanted to uh, mention some of these things. Uh, <clears throat> These red lines here, let me see if my little laser pointer is working. Okay, there we go. This red line along here and uh, here reach to the edges of the sensor here and here. That represents my field of view uh, for this uh, given optical imaging element, which is the pinhole. Then my object size is between these yellow rays here and the image size over here. And then I have a uh, object distance along this path. And then my image distance along this path. And also, of course, the sensor size. OK. <clears throat> So the magnification we define as the image size divided by the object size. And that happens to be equal to the image distance divided by the object distance. Now it doesn't matter. <clears throat> Excuse me. I could be using a pinhole, a lens, a curved mirror. That relationship is gold. I should mention, however, that for complex lenses, we don't necessarily measure from the center of the lens group. And if you look above the slideshow, I happen to have uh, put some additional graphics. That uh, show the difference between simple lenses and complex lenses. Uh, the one at the very top is a simple lens. And we have what we call a principal plane running through that lens, which is the point from which you do all your measurements. You measure your image distance, your object distance um, <clears throat> uh, from that principal plane. However, if I was to look at something like a telephoto lens, which you'll see in the ray tracing uh, on the left-hand side, <clears throat> the pair of lenses, in this case a convex and a concave lens, have provided a combined focal length that is much greater, and it has also moved the principal plane of the combined lenses out in front of the uh, physical lens group. This is the reason that telephoto lenses on a camera can be shorter than the uh, specified focal length closer to Okay, so let's return then to the uh, slideshow. Voice is gone. Back. Hmm. I'm not changing my position. So I, I don't oh, know what's happening. Uh, how much have you missed?
Okay, let's continue on. <clears throat> the field of view, as I've indicated already, is determined by the triangle image sensor and image distance. We have a formula for all this. 1 over the object distance plus 1 over the image distance equals a constant. That constant will turn out to be 1 over the focal length, but you should notice that our pinhole camera doesn't actually have a focal length. Let's go back to our triangles for a moment. If I um, increase my object distance, just move this object outward, that will decrease the image size, thereby decreasing the magnification. Counterwise, if I increase my image distance, that's going to increase the magnification. However, because I did not change my sensor size or the sensor location, well, let me move on. I'll decrease my sensor size, I'm going to decrease the field of view. That red line, I flip back for a second. Oops. You look at the red lines here. And then I go where I have reduced the sensor size. The red line is now down here. You can see that that has reduced my field of view. So field of view is your sensor size versus the distance of the sensor from my uh, principal plane of the optics. Now, <clears throat> suppose I add more pinholes. Well, I think it's going to be fairly obvious. That's going to double my image. So now I have uh, uh, a pretty difficult to view image, but uh, each mannequin is two positions now superimposed. <laughs> yes, double trouble. And, um, uh, you know, so it, it has... Uh... And here we are showing what is going on with ray tracing. For each pinhole, I have a separate ray generating two. Now suppose I took a small prism and I put it over one of the uh, pinholes, as you see here. Okay. That could bend one of my rays and merge those two images. Suppose I had a plate that had a lot of pinholes. I could put a prison over each one. And as you can see, the further out I get from the center, the steeper the prison has to be. Do a whole array of those. I'll just line them up so that the uh, uh, Patanus of each one is in line, and you can see that I'm actually forming a lens shape, just like that. So, you can actually think of a lens as being an infinite number of infinitesimal pinholes, each with an infinitesimal path-bending prism. And I can do the same thing for mirror optics, but uh, because the rays fold back on themselves, that's really hard to draw. And so there we have developing a lens without even using the calculus. All right. So actually, we did use the calculus, but it was well hidden. OK, so it's still all about triangles. But now something special has happened. Because I have rays that come in through different uh, uh, positions on my imaging element, there is one and only one point where they converge and where the image would be in exact focus. And that allows me to characterize uh, the imaging element, in this case a lens, having a particular focal length. Okay, right here. The pinot element, uh, to reiterate, did not have a focus. Every object at any object distance was equally resolved. The fin lens has a focus. 
which means that there is only one image distance where an object will be in exact focus. However, we don't actually need exact focus. An acceptable resolution would allow a range of object distances and a corresponding range of image distances to be considered as in focus. What is that acceptable resolution? Well, an infinitesimal point will be resolved to a minimum size by this size is called the circle of confusion. Any object position, the resolution that is equal to that confusion is an acceptable resolution. It would the human eye uh, has a circle of confusion of about uh, one fifth of a millimeter, 0 0.2 millimeter, at a viewing distance of 25 centimeters. So, you know, roughly a comfortable viewing distance for, say, a book or a picture you would be holding in front of your eyes. So, see uh, lines that are spaced no closer than. And that is roughly uh, uh, 1,020 pixels by uh, 12,000. <clears throat> also, it happens to be something like an 8 by 10. If I used a 35 millimeter sensor to generate this uh... Okay, are we still getting a lot of breakups? Okay, um, do you want me to log out and re-log in then? Okay, I'm going to do that. Hang on. Okay, I'm back. Does this sound a little better? Okay, so continuing on, if we're using a 35 millimeter camera sensor, the allowed sort of confusion is about 0 0.04 millimeters. And uh, most often we'll use a value of 0 0.03 millimeters. And bear in mind that this is referring to the uh, acuity of the human eye when it's looking at the final image, whether printed or displayed in the typical circumstances. This does not indicate the sharpness of the camera. If you had an exact focus, it will be considerably sharper, even though the pixel size of the sensor or whatever may prevent you from being able to see it. Uh, it does indicate the degree to which sharpness can be reduced before it impacts. I'm going to uh, adjust my preferences. Okay, we'll see if that makes a difference to the voice. Okay, 
just for point of information, here is a chart of the uh, circles of confusion for different combinations of uh, format and sensor size. And as I mentioned, for the 35 millimeter, it is about uh, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 uh, millimeters. Okay, so let's talk about depth of field. The range of acceptable distances based on the circle of confusion is the depth of field. And for the object side, we call it depth of field. On the image size, we call it We can define this as the range over which the image sensor can be moved while keeping a fixed object in acceptable focus. We can also give an alternative definition that is the range of optical distances that will be an acceptable focus for a given fixed sensor. So let's take another look at our triangles again. We have our uh, focal length here. We're going to characterize the uh, addition of object distance to image distance. As I move my object away, my image distance has to come closer and closer to the focal length. And if I move to extremes, such as image distance gets very close to the focal length. The mechanics of that is that on your camera lens, there's a pin that uh, sits in a helical slot on the internal barrel of the lens mount. When you rotate the focus ring, it is moving that barrel back and forth in distance. Okay. <clears throat> so remember that the field of view is determined only by the sensor size and the image distance. But we now see that the image distance for objects effectively at infinity, um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, image distance is, is determined by the focal length. So that's the relationship there. And I mentioned the magnification before. Just to reiterate, it's the image size to object size. Okay. <clears throat> and I won't go over that again. We'll just uh, keep going. Okay, so what is that focal length? Now, here is one of our problems. Um, and are we, is everyone, is, a significant number of people not hearing me now. Okay. Photographers, and they're abetted in this by the camera manufacturers, will call the focal length of a lens as the value that would give an equivalent field of view on a 35 millimeter sensor. An example of this is that people often refer to the wide lens on an iPhone as being 28 millimeters, but in reality it is a 4.25 millimeter lens that is paired with a 5.7 millimeter sensor. Now why is that important? For an iPhone, if I focus on an object that is one meter away, the depth of field, that's our acceptable range of resolution, is in the range of half a meter all the way out to infinity. For a 28 millimeter lens on a uh, DLSR, if I focus on an object that is one meter away, the depth of field will be about one meter, well, it would be about uh, 0.9. Very narrow range for a lens. Now, when you have a configuration such that uh, lens aperture and other distance, the depth of field goes to infinity. The near distance is called the hypofocal distance. The hypofocal distance is the closest distance at which a lens can be focused while keeping objects at infinity acceptably sharp. When the lens is focused at this distance, all object at distances from half of the hypofocal distance out to infinity will be acceptably 
And alternatively, you just refer to it as a distance beyond which all objects are effectively sharp for a infinity. Now, there are several ways of uh, determining uh, how to focus for the hypofocal condition. The best way is to simply focus at something that is uh, at infinity, and that will give you a, 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 a decent approximation of having a hypofocal setup. Oh, what is the f-stop equivalent of an iPhone camera? Um, <clears throat> let's see, I uh, have that here somewhere. It's it's a normal f-stop. It's around uh, f2 or the exact number. Of <clears throat> okay, so a lens might be equivalent in terms of field of view, but not in terms of depth of field, and most especially not in terms of the hyper distance. Most shooting situations, your iPhone actually have everything in the So to get a, a bokeh effect, the iPhone has to fake it, and it does that very cleverly. But what is bokeh? Um, <clears throat> in photography, it is uh, the aesthetic quality of the blur produced out of focus parts. This is especially popular for portrait photography. You want your portrait subject to be in, in good focus, maybe a little soft toward the edges, but you want everything else to be blurred out, to almost just be a, a pattern of color that uh, frames the subject. That is controlled by controlling the lens aperture. Now, the aperture changes the active diameter of the lens, the pupil. Increasing aperture diameter increases the amount of lens reaching the sensor by the square of the diameter. So you double the aperture, you increase exposure by four times. Decreasing the aperture decreases the apparent lens diameter, making it more pinhole-like. And as you may remember, that uh, for our pinhole, everything is in the same focus. This is characterized by the F number. Um, <clears throat> we know that the uh, total light is going to be proportional to the square of the diameter divided by the focal length. So we simply let the F number be equal to the focal length divided by the aperture diameter. F number settings are called F stops. We have some conventional stopped values. Uh, as you see the list here, one, one point. Each step to a higher F number decreases exposure by approximately every two step decreases exposure by approximately uh, one half. ISO is our gain. Uh, of course, in the days of film, that was the photosensitivity of the uh, film emulsion. And these days, it is the amplification of the image sensor. Uh, some standard values were established by... Hence, it's called... And we have certain preset values for that that are similar to the effect of f-stops. Uh, in this case, 100, 120. Five, one, six, and every two step increases exposure by about 2.4. So roughly, if I uh, go down uh, two stops in uh, uh, aperture, uh, I'm able to uh, compensate that by changing my ISO by uh, two steps. Okay. Oh, by the way, someone asked if uh, the f-stop was uh, uh, for a specific distance. Uh, no, it's it's not. Uh, the f-stop uh, is independent focal distance. It is true when you change focus, the image distance changes a little bit, but by definition, we simply refer to the f-stop as being 
uh, the aperture and diameter divided by the focal length. Okay, now, there's an optical gain setting for any given image sensor, and usually that's going to be ISO 100, not all the time. Different uh, cameras will vary in this regard. Uh, there are some basic rules, though. Uh, you should expect on a sunny day to be using ISO 100 or 200. Cloudy day, you want to go up to an ISO 4. Indoors, about 8. In low light, then it's. The uh, shutter speed is also in preset values of fractions of a second. 100th, 125, 160th, 1 200th, and so on. And each step decreases exposure by approximately one quarter. There is a well known rule, uh, and that is that uh, to minimize the appearance of handheld shake, you have to use a shutter speed that is faster in seconds than the inverse of the focal. At a 200 millimeter lens, you must use a shutter speed that is shorter than one. Second. <clears throat> well, concerning the ISO speed and the as you increase your ISO, yes, uh, there'll be increasing the amplification sensor. There will be a point where it starts to be a diminishing return. For a modern camera. You know, I've gone up to 1600 easily without getting too bad of an effect. Now, if I go up to 64,000 or much higher, yes, it gets quite noisy. But if I'm working in a low light situation, camera, there's not much else you can do. You're going to make what you can. Okay, just a note, a better way to minimize handheld shake is to eliminate the hand, and that's to use a tripod. Uh, and it is also true that uh, modern lens stabilizers help a lot. Uh, basically, they help by uh, two of the preset values of shutter speed. So if I was uh, using a 200 millimeter lens with a might be able to shoot uh, shutter speed as low as 1 60th of a second. Uh, however, a tripod is better. Now, if you do put your camera onto a tripod, make sure you turn off the lens stabilizer. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, even when there's no shake, the stabilizer continues to hunt and try to uh, stabilize the lens. So it actually starts adding it's a little bit of a on a sturdy tripod. So. Let us say that we're shooting landscapes. What you'll want to do is control your aperture and use the optimal ISO for your sensor. The shutter speed will be set automatically. And this is where your aperture priority mode on your camera should be used. On the other hand, if you're shooting moving objects, you want to control shutter speed and aperture. So you'll basically set your ISO whatever you're going to need for the given light and then set the aperture and speed to what you uh, and you'll be wanting to use your shutter priority uh, mode for that. Okay, then we have the question of our lens, wide, normal, or tele. Now a lot of people say, well, if it's a distant object, I always want to use tele. And if it's a portrait, I want to use wide and so on. It's not really true. The first thing you should do is choose where you want to stand in relation to your subject to get the perspective you desire. Then choose a lens that captures the field of view you need. Uh, you want to minimize the amount of cropping you have to do uh, <clears throat> on the final image. You know, so many people will use uh, what is considered to be a telephoto lens uh, for doing portraits that are fairly close up. Yeah, someone mentioned that uh, the aperture of the lens 
uh, can affect uh, the lens sharpness. And that is true. They have an optimum uh, f-stop for a given lens. OK, now, <clears throat> perspective is based on where you stand in relation to your subjects. And that's only indirectly related to the lens focal length. Here's a scene with a telephoto. And here is the same scene from the same position with the wide. And here is an image that has been cropped from the wide. And you can see that's almost identical to the one that we got with the telephoto. Uh, so my perspective uh, is by where I'm standing. And the amount of cropping that I'm doing is determined by my lens focal length. OK. Um, I just thought I'd show off some pictures at this point. But uh, we'll break for a moment and let you ask some questions. Uh, let's see what we have here on the chat list. Well, yes, and that's why you want to avoid cropping in the uh, uh, post-processing uh, area. So if, uh, for example, in this particular image here, uh, and let's see now, this was taken with 28 millimeter. 28 millimeter. Suppose I'd wanted to focus in on forefronts. Well, photo for that. And it should also be mentioned that uh, there uh, uh, is a, a distortion for the extreme wide angles. Uh, that takes place from the uh, effect of the perspective. Okay. Um, does anyone want to throw in a quick question before I move on? Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, this was a, uh, a typical situation where the light was... In this case, I'm... And this again is 130 millimeters uh, for uh, a similar uh, scene. And this is uh, a, a let me just take a quick look here to see what uh, this one was. OK. This was done with a, a 44 millimeter, which a lot of people consider to be uh, a normal type lens. Okay, and that's another 130 millimeter shot. Okay, and this is a 28 millimeter shot. And uh, this is for an amusement. Uh, this is my sister looking at the mighty Rhine River. Well, she's actually looking at it, uh, a, a small stream coming off the Rhine. I believe the actual Rhine is on the other side of that embankment. Okay. And let's see. This was taken with... 56 millimeter. And by the way, it should be pretty obvious at this point that I was using a zoom lens because no one makes a pro. By the way, what do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> photographers refer to prime lenses as being fixed focal length, uh, top quality lenses, uh, usually with. Uh, fairly wide open apertures available. Uh, zoom lenses are often of very high quality and produce great results, but there's this kind of this viewpoint out there in the professional world that uh, prime lenses are always going to be just a little bit of turning up the nose at zoom lenses. Ah, you know, Every photographer wants to uh, get a cover, and I've only had one cover in my life, and uh, this is a uh, 
little equipment image I took that finally ended up on the cover of Solid State Tech. And it occurs to me I didn't tell you about my background. I'm actually a physicist. I now I'm retired, but I've worked most of my career against matter, in particular in industry. So, but yeah, here's the one and only cover I ever got. <laughs> All right. And uh, this finally was taken with 1,000 millimeters uh, with an F8. And uh, the exposure can only be described as a little while. <laughs> Uh, but, of course, this was August 17th of uh, 2017 during our uh, Great Eclipse. Okay, so I'm open for questions. Hmm. Well, concerning the quality of lenses, you know, there's always going to be a little bit of debate of glass versus plastic. Uh, as it happens, although they'll often have a uh, front and rear element that are made of glass, they could hold up well under B. You'll find out that in a lot of modern lenses, the interior uh, optical components will be of a plastic, and they work just fine. The plastics give them a, a greater selection of optical indices, a greater selection of and aiding. So you'll find quite a bit of uh, plastic optics on the inside. Um, <clears throat> well, the reason that the zoom lenses were uh, often considered to be the telephoto lens is because initially that's the uh, focal lengths they came in. Uh, although I, you know, have around here a uh, 15 through 70 millimeter. See, I believe. What else I have over here? But you yeah, know, you also have them that go up to one hundred and okay, uh, film versus digital. Well, you know, before uh, the mid nineteen nineties, uh, I was all film, and for my black and white, uh, I did my own developing. I basically put together a little uh, bathroom dark and uh, did that. When uh, digital cameras became available, I started using them. And frankly, uh, I find that everything I could have done with film, I'm able to do digital. I know there's quite a bit of controversy over that. There are some schools where uh, the photography professors have. Uh, completely poo-pooed digital uh, photography and said that real artists will only use film and so on. I think they are quickly dying off, uh, both uh, philosophically and physically. Uh, and digital is here to stay. Even interesting controversy. Model R series mirrorless camera. The significance of it is, is that the flange distance, the point where you mount the lens to the image sensor, is only 22 millimeters for their mirrorless cameras, whereas it was 44 millimeters for their uh, uh, DLSRs. Having that reduced flange distance is a big advantage for the optical designers. They have a lot more freedom quality lenses because of the smaller flange distance. The early reports are is that the large series lenses uh, 
live up to that promise. They are very good lenses. The other thing is, flipping mirror into prison uh, from the camera body. That saves both on cost and complexity. There are some real advantages for the mirrorless design. Ah, okay. Let me simply define it this way. I'm going to say that a telephoto is any lens that has a focal length longer than 70 millimeters, whether zoom or fixed. Uh, doesn't matter. A zoom lens is any lens, regardless of the range of focal lengths, that is able to move between focal lengths by uh, the turn of a uh, control ring on the <clears throat> So you can therefore have zoom wide to normal, normal to telephoto, fixed wide. Okay, now concerning the uh, moisture on the lens, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, internally their seals are good enough that you should never get any moisture into internal elements. Do then you? As for the external faces, both rear and the front, you know it's hard to say. Um, Hogging can be a problem. Uh, you know, and you do have to watch out for it. Well, um, I don't know quite how to respond to the question of, of how to make one's ass look not so fat with a, a lens. Uh, however, it is very convenient to always blame the photographer. Okay, there's a question I missed about a bellows extension between lenses. Okay, well, basically, uh, these extenders go between the rear element and the mounting flange. And they simply move the lens further out. Um, <clears throat> Uh, to make the lens behave as if it was a longer focal length. Um, Just a, a second there. I was looking around for a picture I had, which I didn't include. But uh, I've taken my pinhole element and I've put it onto extension rings to show how it acts with, with the extension rings as if it was about a 150 millimeter lens <clears throat> uh, by simply increasing the distance between it and the uh, image sensor. Okay, someone mentioned Vaseline on the lens. Well, to tell you the truth, I would never do that. <laughs> uh, you know, um, 
I think that if I was going to try something like that, I would use a, a clear wax rather than Vaseline. Um, you know, and as you put a little film of wax on the front surface. Um, but uh, for the most part, I just carry along. softer appearance you know um, I would do that either with uh, large aperture and slightly off focus or I would do it uh, uh, with post image processing of course uh, you know they used to use galls and all kinds of things uh, you know to soften up pictures Uh, yes, you could uh, add a filter, and I've had uh, haze filters and, uh, you know, artificial fogs and that kind of thing that I've used in the past. These days, in terms of filters, uh, basically, I think there's only uh, uh, two types of filters that you, you absolutely must have. Uh, and the first is a nice set of neutral density filters. And you want the neutral density filters because you may find yourself in a uh, well-lit situation where you really want to use a wide aperture. Using a neutral, neutral density filter, you can do that. Uh, the other kind of filter I suggest that you have is a polarizer. You cannot duplicate the effects of a polarizer uh, in post-processing. There are many good situations or having a rotatable polarizer on the front of your camera and really uh, uh, give you an interesting image. Oh yes, the polarizer can cut glare. Uh, especially if you're looking at reflected sunlight uh, off of uh, surfaces of water or uh, glass and so forth. I myself like to carry around uh, sheets of uh, Polaroid, uh, polarized uh, plastic, uh, which I will hand hold in front of my lens. That way I don't have to have a set for all my different lens diameters. Uh, and uh, it's easy for me to just, you know, slap it up there and rotate it around and so forth. Okay, now for film, someone asked about different chemistries. Uh, no, I've never done silver versus platinum. Um, uh, you know, I haven't, uh, I basically put away all my chemical darkroom equipment uh, uh, a couple decades ago now. Uh, and, you know, moved on. Uh, and the only thing that kind of bothers me a little bit is that it was fun doing the black and white film. Uh, and uh, I sometimes wonder if I'm missing uh, some of the uh, effects I might get uh, when I use uh, digital photography. But, you know, it is also just a royal pain. It's, it's too... Uh,
I did manage to ruin a sink once with uh, uh, the acetic acid stop solution. Just ate right through the uh, uh, ceramic. Well, you can buy uh, infrared cameras, uh, you know, and uh, they have specialized uses. You know, people do wildlife photography at night and so forth. Um, UV photos, well... Uh, UV does not have a, a great range in the atmosphere, so probably not so much. Okay, looks like we're into our last couple of minutes. Um, are there any additional topics along this line that you would uh, like to hear? Okay, well, thank you all for coming to the Science Circle today uh, on a Sunday, <laughs> and for many of you at uh, uh, very early in the morning, and I suppose for some of you very late at night. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm glad to have had this opportunity. So thank you very much.
uh, as I said, that uh, in regards to uh, disproportionate body parts, you can always blame the photographer. Thank <laughs> you. 